switching a bit to platinums for a minute, I mean, away from Zalota uh, and Cape Cytobine, um, you know, the issue with platinums are we have a potential biomarker. So do people believe in using BRCA status as a biomarker for platinum sensitivity? Yeah. I, I think it's true. Yes. I, the TNT trial showed that. Uh, there's hints of it from other trials like the JEPRAR-6-0. Uh, now, you know, what impact will it have? What will other drugs such as PARP inhibitors play in that landscape is still an open question. But if you're simply asking that question, uh, as to platinum, you know, uh, I think platinums are not necessarily uniquely helpful over other chemo in triple negative, but in, in BRCA uh, mutant, uh, mutation carriers, they are better. So are you sequencing everybody that walks in the door now, Kim? You mean the BRCA germline? Yeah. Triple, triple well, negative breast cancer walks in the door. Um, you know, like someone walks in the bar, you know. Triple negative breast cancer, person with triple negative breast cancer walks in the door. Do you do BRC sequencing? Um, in the absence of family yes. history. Well, so in the, um, family family history. History. In the early stage, right. in the early stage setting, if they're <coughs> eligible for platinum-based therapy, if I'm going to give in the preoperative setting, I don't give platinums in the adjuvant setting. But if they have a big enough tumor that I'm considering preoperative therapy, I will send them for testing. And I think after um, this ASCO meeting, I think. For the majority, if not all, of my patients facing recurrent or metastatic triple negative breast cancer, I think the standard will become that they need to have BRCA testing. So, Deb, yep. do you want to? Well, go ahead, Carlos. You can no, no. I mean, Deborah. based on the data of Fergus Couch, triple negatives with sporadic-looking cancers that have a family history have up to a 20% chance of having a germline mutation. But what about the ones that don't have a family history? So, if someone walks in the door. She's not an orphan, but say has has a. You know, a, a mom and two sisters who don't have breast I cancer, would rely, who uh, has a triple negative breast cancer, I would, she's I would, 50. I would rely on the advice on the genetic, the genetic, genetic counselors and the need or not that that patient having germline testing. But just to be clear, the, the NCCN guidelines yeah, and the American yeah. Everybody Society under 65 of Human Genetics are uh, with a triple negative, I agree. Yeah. But the, the real question, because we've now turned this, especially we're going to talk about PARP inhibitors in a second, but at least with platinum, We've turned this now to a therapeutic decision, from a screening yeah. decision yeah. to a therapeutic yeah. decision. Yep. It's a totally different thing. You know, so we're not worried, I mean, we're still worried about screening the family for mutations, but it's now really, it'll determine our therapy. Yep. So. Yeah, and I, again, we have a one out of five chance of detecting HER2 amplification, one out of three, and we have a therapy linked to that, and we right. test for it uniformly, and I think BRCA is at that point in the metastatic setting. The difference between BRCA and HER2 is that there's implications for other people other than the patient. And we as a society will have to deal with that because here How are we is do that? precision medicine is here. You can have your own um, DNA sequenced and it has implications for your own family members too. So I don't, I don't think this is a unique example. We, uh, we're going to run out of time if we have a, dis a discussion about a precision, precision medicine, but yeah. honestly, I think we're going to have to embrace it now that there's with, a therapeutic. Yeah, we decided to offer uh, to our patients now, we, the tumors that we sequence, uh, we sequence a lot of uh, tumors every, every year, the germline data, now they can sign a consent, and we encourage them to obtain the consent. Our uptake has been has been incredibly high. Patients want to know if you offer to them, and interestingly enough, the people that were more reserved were actually the experts. Like the really? yes, the right. physicians are the ones that said, "My God, this is going to be so complex. Nobody will sign up." We open up the trial. We open up the consent, and the take uh, the, uh, the take up has been incredibly high. So, we will need to learn to live with information that can determine outcome to therapy and prognosis, and we just need to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, in some cases, in our institution, we like at uh, yours institutions, we sequence anybody with triple negative and metastatic disease, uh, stage four disease, and is eligible for a trial. You do. And so there'll be a back way of getting through the back door to a germline alteration, and we seldom find one in the patient that clearly doesn't have a family history. Okay. Yeah. Seldom found one. Okay. I think it's a good time to enter the field of genetic counseling. Like I'm encouraging both my children, uh, uh, and there's a national shortage of genetic counseling. There's a total shortage. That's counselor. the problem. You have no, uh, there's no one to counsel and the patients. And so I think every it. practice is going to have right. to deal with this in a very Absolutely. unique way. They're going to have to look at you know the vendors of the different assays. Do they have remote genetic counselors? Because that's the reality in rural United States. There aren't genetics counselors, right. and then this is burden's going to fall on the treating oncologist, even on the primary care doctor. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I agree. I'm more worried about that than actually doing the testing and the implications. Is helping patients and providers really 
figure out what this data all means.